Our scripture lesson today begins shortly after Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit fell upon the disciples and they began preaching to the people who came from all over the world to attend the Pentecost feast. Each person heard the good news in his or her own language. They heard how Jesus overcame death on, on, by rising on the third day and how he ascended into heaven where he sits at the right hand of God. Jesus did not come to us empty-handed. He came with the power to deliver people from their sins and overthrew the power of death. By the time the sun set on the evening of Pentecost, the seeds of the church were already beginning to sprout. And now in today's text, Luke gives us a snapshot of what that early church looked like. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. Awe came upon everyone because many wonders and signs were being done by the apostles. All who believed were together and held all things in common. They would sell their possessions and goods and distribute the proceeds to all as any had need. Day by day, as they spent much time together in the temple, they broke bread at home and ate their food with glad and generous hearts praising God and having the goodwill of all the people. And day by day, the Lord added to the number those who were being saved. This is the word of God for the people of God. Will you join me in this prayer from Ignatius of Loyola? Teach us, Lord, teach me to be generous to serve you as you deserve, to give and not to count the cost, to fight and not to heed the wounds, to toil and not to seek for rest, to labor and not to look for any reward, save that of knowing that I do your holy will. Amen. For our guests and friends who are, were not with us last week, both Pastor Anne Marie in the 1111 service and I in the 9 o'clock service are preaching a two week series on stewardship. Last week we looked at the why of stewardship, why we give. We saw that we don't give out of guilt, we don't give out of fear, we're not trying to buy God's blessing, we give out of gratitude for everything that God has given us, starting with the gift of life and placing people in our lives who did for us those things we could not do for ourselves. You know, human beings are the most needy, the most vulnerable of all the mammals when, when they're born. They can't do anything. They're totally dependent. There were people in our lives who took care of us, parents, Grandparents, guardians, adoptive parents, aunts, uncles. The idea that any person is self-made is a joke. We don't feed, clothe, and shelter ourselves as newborns. Someone did those things for us. We don't teach ourselves to read or count or play an instrument. Someone has to teach us those things. The proficiency with which we're able to earn a living, the intellectual and physical aptitude, the health, the strength, the drive, all of it came to us straight from the hand of God. In fact, that next breath you take, it's a gift from God. This was ingrained in me as a child whenever I spent time at my paternal grandmother's house over in Smithfield. I would be staying with her overnight, and every night we knelt by her bed. The dog would jump up in a chair, and it too would very properly bow its head as my grandmother said our evening prayer. And she always ended her prayer the same way, and wake us in the morning. She saw every day as a gift from God, and she acknowledged it 
every night. And it didn't take long for me to learn that Ninny, which is what I called her, was a gift from God to me. And my hope is that every one of you had someone like her in your life. As I spoke of my grandmother, I hope you were seeing the face of a person in your life who loved you, who championed you, who even when you played Monopoly and you landed on her property would not charge you rent. (laughs) They're gifts from God. Without them, our lives would have been so empty. Of course, the love that they showed us, the love that they lavished on us and perhaps still lavish on us was just a fraction of God's love toward us. Remembering my grandmother's love makes me think of God's love and how good God is to me. Over the years, there are many faces, other people who loved and believed in me, even when I didn't believe in myself. And I see a bit of God in each one of them. To paraphrase Archbishop Fulton Sheen, they are all sparks from the great hearth of God's love. The gift of life is blessing enough. But then all the other blessings, not to mention the greatest blessing of all, the gift of God's own son, Jesus Christ, who came to correct so many misconceptions about God, that God is some angry judge who takes delight in torturing those who disobey, or that God is distant and aloof, uncaring. Jesus talked about God. He used analogies like that of a loving parent who dearly loves each one of us or like a shepherd who knows each lamb individually and can call them by name, who when a lamb gets lost, one lamb out of a hundred gets lost, goes out and searches for that lost lamb, and when, not if, but when he finds it, he doesn't stop until he finds it. He puts that lamb on his shoulder, brings it home, and celebrates. God is like the shepherd whose love for the sheep will cause him to lay down his own life for the sheep. And Jesus also revealed that God was one who kept God's promises. In the Gospel of Luke, which is the prequel to the book of Acts, Jesus promised his followers that the Holy Spirit would fill them and give them strength, give them courage, and give them gifts to proclaim the gospel around the world. Just a few verses before today's scripture, God kept that promise. And when the Holy Spirit descended on God's followers, the results were quick. 3,000 people were brought into the fellowship. They too received the Holy Spirit, and signs of the kingdom were beginning to be seen everywhere, everywhere. Everywhere, members of the fellowship of Jesus were present. And that's why they gave so generously, as we read in today's text, and why we give out of gratitude, not only for what God has given us, for what God continues to do in our lives. And as Christians, members of this church, We're grateful for what God continues to do through the missions and ministries of this church. Today, we're shifting to how we give. And the how we give is reflected in this passage. According to Jesus, one of the signs of the kingdom of God is that nobody goes hungry. Everybody eats. And one of the characteristics of the early gatherings of Christians was that everybody ate. As a church, we have community meals once a month and special dinners for certain holidays. But we also make sure that the hungry are fed through our Feed Our Kids program in the summer, the United Methodist Men's Weekend Meal program that feeds kids over the weekends during the school year, your donations to the Helping Hands Fund, and our food closet And then as of last Friday, a $5,000 donation to Nutrition Services in the Grapevine 
Colleyville School District. That gift will cover the kids who didn't qualify for the free lunch but still can't afford it for the rest of the year. You can't learn if you're hungry. The kingdom of God is not present so long as someone's hungry. There's nothing that embodies the mission and ministry of Jesus more than feeding the hungry, especially if you read Luke's gospel and its sequel. Jesus and the apostles are always eating. In fact, there's a book, and its title is something like Eating with Jesus and the Apostles in Luke. And it's amazing how often Jesus is seen eating, and it's even more amazing who Jesus eats with. I remember a couple of preachers were talking on a podcast one day, and one of them said, Jesus ate a lot of good food with a lot of bad people. <laughs> Sometimes he did eat with the wrong people. But they were wrong only in the culture's eyes, not in God's eyes. They were some of those lost sheep that God was calling home. Fred Craddock said one time, whenever you have a group of people who have more than enough to eat and another group of people who are going without, you have something, but never call it the kingdom of God. Every time we help with food, whether it's a gift card to somebody, the Rise Against Hunger, where the church teamed up with the Rotary Club and prepared 20,000 soup kits, the United Methodist Men's Wheat Meal Program or paying students meals at school, we're striking a blow for the kingdom of God. We're demonstrating what it's like to live in the kingdom of God, to live as a kingdom person. One time when I was in Alito, we had a period of weeks where we had some very unique cries for help, and several of them came because we had a school nurse who was strategically placed at a school who would call me whenever there was a need. And one time, a kid needed some special shoes to help him walk. We had another child who needed some glasses. We were also helping pay for some hearing testing and stuff. Anyway, I, it was kind of coming at random times, and I didn't put it together until a few weeks later when the Scripture was when Jesus preached his first sermon or when Jesus was uh, out preaching and, and some of John's disciples came to him and they said, John wants to know, are you the Messiah? Or should we expect another? And Jesus says, go back and tell John what you see and what you hear. The blind see, the deaf receive their hearing, and the lame walk. It sort of said in a way that we had just done what Jesus said were signs of the kingdom of God. And, you know, as we take feeding the hungry seriously, we're engaging in a very holy act. In the accounts of Jesus feeding the 5,000, the language the gospel writers use to describe how Jesus distributed the food are the same words that the gospel writers used to describe Jesus' actions during the communion service. He took, blessed, broke, and gave. And what that tells me is that any time the hungry are fed, you come very close to a sacrament. Christ is equally present. Now, I have to tell you that when I taught disciple Bible study, today's scripture gave some people a case of the fantods because these words, all who believed were together and held all things in common. Somebody said, that sounds like communism to me. <laughs> it was more like communalism. I remember some of the seminarians at Bright Divinity School when I attended classes there. Some of them were married and they lived in the dorms or in student housing. They weren't paid a lot of money at their churches. They were at school on scholarships and loans. And there often wasn't a lot enough money for, for food. And 
what these seminarian families would do in those suiting housing areas would pool their resources so that they would all have a common supper at night. And I think that was what was happening in the early church. Also, as Jesus predicted, some people were disowned by their parents or their families because they became followers of Jesus. Entire families might be um, kicked out of the synagogue. Others um, might be ostracized in their community. And, uh, you know, they ran businesses and people would no longer patronize their shops And so the church became a haven for them. The church community became for them what sociologists call a fictive family. You remember when Mary went to get Jesus because she'd heard words that Jesus was insane and that uh, perhaps some people were saying he had a demon and she was going to take him home and keep him safe. And she came to that house where he was teaching, but he wouldn't come out. And they said, your mother, your brothers, your sisters are outside calling for you. He said, who is my mother? Who are my brothers and sisters? And then he looked at this little crowd who had left everything to follow him. He said, here is my mother. Here are my brothers, my sisters. That became a reality for many people in the early church. The church was their family. And I think for many of you, That's what First United Methodist Church of Colleyville is, isn't it? Isn't it your family? One of my mom's best friends was a member of the church that I grew up in, and I remember they used to laugh. They said, we're just like sisters, only we don't fight. Some of our best friends, some of the people that we depend on, some of the people we love the most, if it weren't for the church, we'd have never met. In some cases, gratitude caused some early believers to sell what they had. In fact, all that they had. Selling everything wasn't a requirement, but it was a reality for some of Jesus' followers. In fact, it was certainly a reality for Simon Peter and the other disciples. You remember Simon Peter once reminded Jesus, you know, we left everything to follow you. In John Wesley's notes on the New Testament, Wesley said that those in those early congregations who gave all they had did it out of love. He said it was a natural fruit of that love wherewith each member of the community loved every other as his own soul. Now, we're not asked to do that, but we are called to love one another as much as we love ourselves, which means you can't just be indifferent when someone else is hurting, when someone else is hungry, when someone else is lost, when someone else doesn't have a place like this. Love is one of the main ways we give back to God for all God has given us. And we love as Jesus taught us to love, and not just in the easy, cuddly, lovable folks, But those prickly ones, too, those folks that almost make it impossible to love them because as much as you know they need community, they keep pushing away. And it even extends to our enemies. Of course, when you love, you can't help but be generous, right? I mean, what are the limits? When Caden, our first great nephew, was around two, we were keeping him a lot during the week, and Terry would often give him a bath, and he loved playing in the bubbles and stuff, but I thought that was a little boring, and I was in a store one day, and I saw some plastic boats that I thought Caden would really enjoy, brightly colored. I bought them, and I lined them up in the bathtub late Sunday night. So when Caden came on Monday, he would have them there waiting for him. Now, this was after Terry had told me not to buy Caden any more toys, <laughs> that he had enough. But how could you ignore it? I mean, they were perfect. And so as I was getting out of bed, Terry walked by, and she just kind of in passing said, 
Well, I see the Navy arrive last night. <laughs> when you love someone, how much is too much? Generosity is how we respond to God's love. We're generous with our money. We're generous with our time. The text says that the early followers of Jesus would sell their possessions and goods and distribute the proceeds to all as any had need. And I got to thinking, what would that look like? And I realized, and I apologize, I'm sorry, Dave Boyd isn't here because, as you know, um, well, Dave Boyd would appreciate this. Um, it sounds like what they actually had was a church-wide garage sale. And Dave, you know, is, is putting, planning one and helping put together one with some other volunteers uh, in September. And, you know, as you think about that early church, you can see people bringing their stuff at the drop-off center, pulling up in their carts, people taking things out of their carts while others were putting the prices on them, half a denarii for a lightly used toga, 10 shekels for an infant chariot seat, big sign announcing the upcoming sale, ichthus, which is, you know, the Jesus fish sign, red or yellow, black or white, your patronage is precious in our sight. For those of you who don't know Dave Boyd, Dave is, like I said, working hard on that, and I hope he appreciates this. You know, one of my churches held a garage sale every year, and it was amazing. In less than 24 hours, our fellowship hall was transformed and looked just like first Monday in Canton. It was such a blessing to our community. It, held just, uh, it was held just before school started, and you could buy kids blue jeans for a quarter. There were also some really cool toys, and there was this one elderly lady who was buying a bunch of stuff, and... She was on a fixed income, and she said this garage sale was such a blessing to her every year. It was where she bought her Christmas gifts for her grandchildren. The garage sale, not just going to benefit the church, it's a mission and a blessing to our community. It's also the way at least one day in our facility actually looked, our, looked like our community. It was a glorious blend of races and nationalities. Income diversity. The point of today's text is that in those days, nobody went without. The believers were living out Jesus' command to feed and clothe their neighbors, all of them. The giving here implies more than just the giving of items and money. It also implies the giving of time in a variety of ways. Now, Luke says they were praising God and devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and fellowship. In other words, everything they did was almost part of their worship, but also they were taking time, spending time in worship and study. They spent their time. He uses the word spent like you would spend money. Think about time as a resource. They spent their money at the temple sharing their faith, inviting others to join them in this new thing that God was doing. Luke says that because of their generosity, they had the goodwill of all the people. As you know, on Friday, there was another threat to the synagogue down the street, a bomb threat. It was not just that synagogue, but several synagogues throughout in all different places, even outside of the country. Fortunately, it turned out to be a hoax. But, you know, I went just to show my support for them, and I want you to know this idea about the goodwill of all the people. This church has the goodwill of Congregation Beth Israel. I want you to know that when you talk to our mayor or people on the city council, this church stands in the goodwill of those folks because they know we're a church that can be counted on. Our schools, they know we're a church that can be counted on. Now, when it says they had the goodwill of all the people, that tells me that that church wasn't just taking care of themselves. They were reaching beyond their walls to the poorest in the community, and their neighbors saw it and were impressed by them. 
The more the people shared their faith and shared their gifts and graces in the community, the more open people became to listening to them. In other words, you know, you've been there. You, I see something in you. Tell me more about this Jesus who's changed your life because what I see in you, I want for myself. It's the classic example of the old adage, people don't care what you know until they know that you care. And because the Spirit of God was so active, it says God added to the numbers those who were being saved. That church wasn't afraid of growing. They welcomed growth because they knew that growth was what God wanted. A friend of mine actually served a church that had a stated goal not to grow beyond 400 people. They wanted to stay at a manageable size where everybody knew everybody and everybody knew exactly what was going on in all the different places. But that's not what a church is supposed to be about. And my friend friend rightly called them on their goal. He said, tell me, if we have 399 members and I have a married couple join, which one do I turn away? The early church was a welcoming church. People looked at these followers of Jesus and were so moved that they actually said, I want what they have. Now, all these ways of responding to God's love are still available. In fact, they have been codified in our vows of membership. The grateful response every member makes when he or she joins with the church. We will support the church with our prayers, our presence, our gifts, our service, and, not or, and our witness to others. These things we do not out of coercion or fear or guilt, but out of love for God and love for one another. Craig Craddock used to talk about the early days in his ministry. He served a little church in Tennessee uh, near a place called Watts Bar Lake, And every Easter, they would hold their baptisms there at the lake, and people would come, and they would cook out, and they would have a kind of an evening of hymns and singing and food and baptism of all the new members. And Craddock said that the first time he was there, after the baptisms, they would set up little tents for people to change clothes, and he was the last one to change clothes. They would all gather by the fire, and uh, Glenn Hickey who was a longtime member, stood, and this was his job. He introduced every member of the church around that fire to the new members. He gave their names, where they lived, and their work. And then each person in the circle then responded as he introduced them, yes, my name is blank, and if you ever need somebody to do the washing or the ironing, Call me. My name is blank, and if you need somebody to chop wood, knock on my door. Someone else, maybe a youth, said, my name is so-and-so, and and if you need somebody to babysit, I'm your person. And so it went on, if you need somebody to repair your house, if you want somebody to sit with the sick, went all the way around the circle. They ate, Craddock said, and they had a square dance, and Then at a time when it was time to close things down, Percy Miller with the thumbs in his bibbed overalls would announce, time to go, and everybody left. And he lingered behind, and with his big shoe, he kicked sand over the dying fire. And Craddock was standing there next to him, and the man looked at Craddock, and he said, Craddock, folks don't ever get any closer than this. This is the community that God calls us to be. And your giving helps make that possible. The giving of your time, the giving of your money, the giving of your talents. I want to thank you for all you've done in the past and for what you're going to be doing in the future. And we're going to invite you to bring your commitment cards forward and place them on the chancel rail. And... It's your opportunity to declare your thanks for what God has given you. We're not just asking for money. We also need your service. In fact, on the pledge card, we've actually highlighted a few ways that 
you can really help us in the year ahead? Now, as folks respond, remember that some will have already responded online or maybe responding online as they're sitting in the pew and won't have a card to be uh, brought down. But may we be in an attitude of prayer and discernment as we consider what God is calling us to do. And I believe Jun Wan will be playing, and when we're done, we'll have a prayer of blessing. Thank you again so much for being who you are and for being so generous. Amen.